Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, Tutorial 9A. This is the first of two tutorials focused on accounting for income taxes. This tutorial uses the Prometheus Limited example. We'll be looking at it from the year 2020 in a situation where we have taxable income. The learning objectives for this tutorial include preparation of a schedule to reconcile accounting income to taxable income and calculate current income tax expense. Second, to prepare a schedule to determine the ending, deferred, or future income tax balances on the balance sheet and calculate any deferred or future income tax expenses or recovery. Third, we will prepare journal entries to record any current and deferred future income tax expense or recovery. Fourth, we will prepare a partial income statement showing provisions for current and future or deferred income taxes and prepare a partial balance sheet showing income tax related accounts under IFRS and ASPE. So again, this tutorial is based on the Prometheus Limited example. It's important that you have pre-read the information so that we're able to attack this accounting for income tax problem. Our first requirement will be for 2020 to prepare a schedule to reconcile accounting income to taxable income and calculate the current income tax expense. We'll begin with our first step, which is the reconciliation to taxable income. And we will start by focusing on permanent differences. Remember that permanent differences are those items that are neither tax deductible nor taxable when it comes to accounting calculations. So what we do is we start with our net income for accounting purposes and our net income was $895,000. And then now we look at making adjustments for permanent differences. The first of which is non-taxable dividends. The company received dividends from another company and dividends between companies are not taxable. What we must do is deduct $3,000 because that $3,000 is included in the $895,000 in income and we want to deduct it because the company won't be paying tax on it. Then we look at adding back any non-deductible items. And so the first one here is club dues or golf club dues. Those kinds of promotional things are 100% non-deductible. So they cannot be deducted from our income. So we must add those back to the accounting income so that tax will be properly calculated on them. The next item to add back are non-deductible meals and entertainment. Generally, 50% of meals and entertainment are not tax deductible. And so, because the total meals and entertainment were $60,000, 50% of that is deductible. So we will add back $30,000. Next, we have these last two items, and both of those are related to the disposal of an asset. So what happened was the company sold an asset, and it received $20,000 in proceeds on it and the net book value was $8,000. When you calculate any accounting gains or losses on your books, you take your proceeds minus the net book value, and the company recorded a gain on disposal of $12,000. Now, accounting gains and losses are not taxable or tax deductible. So this non-taxable accounting gain has to be deducted from the accounting income of 895,000 because the income is too high by including this item. We're going to subtract the non-taxable accounting gain. And then the other side of that is in rare situations, the company might end up selling an asset for more than its original cost. What we have here is just that situation. Now, according to the, the tax rules, what happens is when you sell an asset, what comes out of the CCA pool is the lower of cost or proceeds. And usually an asset depreciates in value and it is sold for less than its original cost. But we wanted to introduce you to a potential situation here where the proceeds were actually more than the cost. When your 20,000 in proceeds is more than the original cost, you end up with a situation where you have a capital gain. Now only 50% of that is taxable because capital gains are taxed at 50%. So this $5,000 difference between proceeds and original cost times 50% is $2,500 that is taxable. So that's why this 2,500 is added back to our accounting income as we get closer to taxable income. Now we can continue on and we will now focus on the temporary differences section. Remember temporary differences are situations where those where items are either taxable or tax deductible for income tax purposes, but over a different period of time than taxes calculated for accounting purposes. This particular question has five items that we need to deal with. So the first is depreciation and CCA. Accounting depreciation 
um, as you will recall, is based on the company's accounting policy. This company showed 35000 in depreciation expense, which is not deductible. But what is deductible for tax purposes is the capital cost allowance, the CCA. The company's CCA claim is 41910 so when we add back the depreciation and subtract the CCA, we end up with a net $6,910 adjustment. Then we have another item here that is the interest expense. This problem includes a bond, and as you may recall, under IFRS and as recommended under ASPE, corporations use the effective interest rate approach to calculate interest expense on bonds and notes. In this case, the interest expense shown on the company's income statement using the effective interest rate approach is 60327 but the effective rate interest is not deductible for tax purposes. The only item that's deductible is the actual interest that's paid, and that's based on the face rate of a bond. So we have to add back the non-deductible interest expense of 60327 and then subtract the $55,000 actual interest paid. And that gives us a net adjustment back to our accounting income of 5327 The next item here is a patent. While this problem states that the costs incurred on the patent are fully deductible for income tax purposes, we can then adjust and reduce our taxable income by the $100,000 for the amount of the patent costs that are deductible. Of course, accounting policy says we don't do that. That patent would be capitalized and would be amortized over the appropriate period of time. But what you would see in uh, future reconciliation to taxable incomes in, in the problem would be the amortization expense added back on the patent until the patent is fully amortized or disposed of. So we're going to subtract $100,000 here on the patent because the costs are deductible. The last item to deal with is the warranty. The company incurred $51,000 in warranty expense, but remember, warranty expense is an estimate. And estimates are not deductible for tax purposes. Only the actual costs incurred are deductible. So we must add back the non-deductible $51,000 warranty expense estimate and subtract the actual costs incurred of $47,000, which are deductible for a net add back to our accounting income of $4,000. When all is said and done, starting with our net income for accounting purposes of 895,000, adding back and subtracting all of our temporary and permanent differences, we end up with taxable income of $818,417. And we multiply by the current tax rate, not the future tax rate. Some problems will give you different tax rates, so you have to make sure that we're using the current rate. Multiply by 35% here, gives us current taxes payable of $286,446. Our second requirement here for the year 2020, we'll prepare a schedule to determine the ending deferred or future tax account balance on the balance sheet and calculate any deferred or future income tax expense or recovery. We're using the term deferred and future to allow us flexibility if we were doing this under ASPE or IFRS. IFRS uses deferred and ASPE uses future. Let's begin with the deferred tax calculations for property, plant, and equipment. And the approach I'm illustrating works like this. We always start with the tax basis, and we take the tax base minus the accounting base. That will give us a balance, right? That would be the temporary difference, the timing difference. We multiply that the balance by an enacted tax rate. That'll give us an ending deferred tax balance that we need on our balance sheet. For the property, plant, and equipment, we calculate the 2017 ending UCC balance based on this set of calculations right here. So we have an opening balance of 411,840, which carried forward from the end of 2019. There was an addition of 110,000, and the data says there was a disposal with the, an original cost of 15,000. Just as an aside, what comes out of the CCA pool is a lower of cost or proceeds. Even though the proceeds were 20000 on the sale, we remove the original cost. Then we deduct the CCA that was claimed during the year, which gives us an ending UCC balance of 464930 and that gives us our balance right here. Next, we will look at the accounting base. The accounting base has a supporting calculation that starts with the carry forward from the end of 2019 of 418000 
we add the addition, and then we take out the net book value of the disposal. So even though on the tax calculation side, we take out the lower of cost or proceeds, when we derecognize an asset for accounting purposes, remember we have to credit the asset for its original cost and debit accumulated depreciation. In this case, this $8,000 is simply the net book value, and that's given in the data of the asset disposed. And then during the year, there's $35,000 in depreciation expense. So that gives us an ending tax basis of $485,000, and that's where we end up here. Knowing our ending UCC is $464,930, and the ending accounting basis is $485,000, this results in a timing difference of $20,070. Now the number is negative because of the way I've done the calculation. What this means here is any negative number is reported as a credit. And hopefully this makes sense because if we have a UCC balance, a tax basis of 464,930, which is less than the accounting basis of 485,000, this means that the company has claimed the tax benefit from CCA faster than it is expensing depreciation for accounting purposes. So when you have that situation, you end up with a deferred tax difference of a credit balance. If you switch these around, the tax base and the accounting base, you'll end up with a positive number, but that doesn't mean it's just going to be a debit timing balance. In this case, whenever your UCC is less than your CCA, you will always have a credit balance. Then we take that 27,070 times the enacted tax rate that applies in the future of 35%, that results in an ending balance of 7025. That's the number that we would have actually on our balance sheet. And this column here, this ending deferred tax or future tax account, we can actually illustrate using a T account. And what we've calculated here is the ending balance of 7025. Now we know the ending balance is 7025. Well, in order to figure out the amount of the adjustment, we need to know the beginning balance. The beginning balance is determined based on the beginning balances. So if we had a beginning UCC of 411,840 and a beginning tax basis amount of 418, the difference between those two, as illustrated in this red box down here, the tax basis is 411,840 minus the accounting basis of 418 is a credit balance of 6160. Now the rate that was applicable to the previous year was 40%. So this gives us an opening DIT balance of 2464 credit. That goes here, 2464. Once we have our T account for the ending balance for the DIT account, we can determine how much of an adjustment is necessary. If we need to end up with a balance of 7025 credit, and we have a beginning balance of 2464 credit, we need an adjustment to this account of 4,561 would be a credit to the DIT account. And then the last column here just finishes out the journal entry. If we have a credit to the deferred tax account for PPE of 4,561, then we need a debit to the income statement of 4,561. Basically what happens is this column number six in my approach here gives you a T account and then these two columns here, seven and eight, give you what you need to create the journal entry. The next item up is the warranty expense. When it comes to the tax basis, for everything except property, plant and equipment and something like goodwill, the tax basis is actually zero. The UCC represents costs that were incurred that are not fully deductible, they're deducted over time. But when it comes to expenses like warranty or pensions or anything like that, the actual costs incurred are fully deductible. The only thing that is not deductible are the estimates. So what we have here is a tax basis of zero and an accounting basis of $24,000. And that represents the T account balance for our warranty liability. And if you look at the information provided, the warranty liability has a beginning balance of $20,000. We are told that the warranty expense is 51000 so we would debit expense credit warranty payable, and then the warranty costs incurred are 47000 That leaves us with an ending balance of $24,000 credit. So when we take zero tax basis minus 24000 credit, we end up with a $24,000 debit timing difference times 35% tax rate gives us an $8,400 deferred tax or future tax asset. It's an asset because if we presume that eventually all of that estimate is going to be deducted when paid in the future, we're going to have to pay out warranty claims. 
So those will be deducted in the future. They represent future deductibility. Therefore, it's an asset. And if we kept a T account for the deferred income tax related to warranties, we have a beginning balance of $8,000 and we have an ending deferred balance of $8,400. What that means is we need an adjustment of $400, so a debit to the deferred tax warranty account and a credit to the income statement of $400. The next item relates to the patent. Remember that all of the patent is deductible for tax purposes and not for accounting purposes, so the UCC or the tax base is zero. We subtract $100,000 to give us a negative $100,000, so we have a credit, times 35% is a $35,000 deferred income tax liability as it relates to the patent. So if we were to draw a quick deferred income tax account for the patent, we have an ending balance now of 35,000. A beginning balance of zero means we need an adjustment of 35,000 dollars. So we'll credit the deferred income tax account and debit the deferred or future income tax account on the income statement. The last item we have now relates to the bond amortization. Again, the amount that's actually paid in cash for the bond interest is fully deductible, so there's no tax basis, no undeductible amount but we have a difference of 5,327 that relates to the bond interest expense based on the effective interest rate approach. Remember the difference between the interest paid of $55,000 and the interest expense minus the 60,327 expense is 5,327 amortization of the bond premium or discount. So zero minus 5327 becomes a debit, right? Zero minus a negative is a positive. So we get future deductibility on this. So times 35% is 1,865. The beginning balance on this account is zero. So if we to draw a deferred income tax expense for the bond, the beginning balance is zero. The ending balance is 1865. So we need an adjustment here of 1865. That would be a debit to the deferred income tax for the bond and a credit to the income statement. So when all is said and done, what we have here on our balance sheet combined is a net $31,760 income tax liability. We are going to have a journal entry that's for $37,296. That's how all this comes together, line by line, how you have a deferred tax asset and liability. The next requirement would be to prepare the journal entries to record the current income tax expense and any deferred or future tax expense or recovery. We have two journal entries, one for the current income tax expense. If we go back to the income statement, you saw that we had determined the income tax expense was $286,446. So we will debit current income tax expense for 286446 and credit income tax payable for 286446. The second entry is going to be for the deferred or future income tax expense. Again, IFRS uses deferred, ASPE uses future. And I'm bringing up our completed deferred income tax table here to show that the numbers that we are looking for are right here. The sum of all of the net debits and credits from our deferred income tax table form the basis for this journal entry. We're going to debit future income tax expense. If you do the table properly and set the tax basis up first, minus the accounting basis, then everything works out nicely. You'll get the debits and credits correct. We have a couple of debits and a couple of credits, but we have more debits and credits. So we have a net 37,296 deferred income tax expense, and we have a deferred income tax liability of 37,296. The importance of the table cannot be understated because this gives you everything you need. It gives us the source of the journal entries and our ending balance sheet balances. Our next requirement will be to prepare a partial income statement beginning with the accounting net income and then include any provisions for current and future or deferred income tax expense. Now we will proceed to step four, which is to prepare the partial income statement. So what I'm going to demonstrate is a correct version of a partial income statement for 2020 that's applicable to both IFRS and ASPE. 
The first thing you do is you begin with your income before income taxes and you use the accounting income as provided. The accounting income provided was $895,000. Then we have a small section here that's provision for income taxes. And within that section for provision for income taxes, you include current income tax expense. We arrived at this number in the first step uh, with the reconciliation to taxable income and where we calculated our income tax expense and payable. So 286,446 is the current income tax expense. And then from all the work we did in our deferred or future tax calculations, we have an item again under the provision for income taxes for deferred future tax of 37,296. So our total provision for income taxes is $323,742, resulting now in final net income of $571,258. Now on to requirement five, where we need to prepare a partial balance sheet for the year 2020, showing the presentation of all income tax related accounts as they would appear under both IFRS and ASPE. So let's do this partial balance sheet. First, we'll show a partial balance sheet as it appears under IFRS. And to do that, we'll use our little table to help us here at the bottom. Notice that as indicated before, this column gives you everything you need to know. When it comes to IFRS, the entire amount of the income tax liability is long term. But what we have here is a current income tax payable, which is related to the current income tax expense. So we have 286,446 as a current liability for the current income tax payable. And then we have a long-term liability for the deferred income tax. And again, we're calling it deferred because it's IFRS for $31,760. And you see here, the total for this column is $31,760. It's the combined ending balance, not the adjusting entry. And under IFRS, it's always long-term. Now I'm gonna bring up in blue the partial balance sheet under ASPE. This one's a little bit more complex. We still have the current liability of 286,446 for current income taxes payable. But now under ASPE, we have to separate the future income tax assets and liabilities into their current and future portions because 60,000 will come due in 2021 and then the remainder in 2022 and as per the instructions at 35% we have a future income tax and current liability of $21,000 for the patent costs and then the future income tax asset related to the warranty of 8,400 as given in the table down here is the 8,400 for the warranty now, what happens with ASPE is any current future income tax liabilities and current future income tax assets are netted out. That's why we can show 12,600 because we're taking the 21,000. Again, this is a liability and this is an asset, but we can net them out. In terms of long-term liabilities, we have the remaining 40,000 in 2022 times 35% for the patent costs. So between these two, they must add up to, guess what, 35,000, 21 current and 14 deferred. The property, plant, and equipment is always long-term. Then when it comes to the bonds, they will continue to be long-term as well until the bond matures. Now, this also happens to be an asset because it has a debit balance, but because under ASPE, all long-term assets and liabilities can also be netted out. So between the two liabilities and the future income tax asset, we can net them out. So we have a net long-term liability of 19,160. But when you add the two up, 12,600 plus 19,160, it's still $31,760. Okay, so now for some key points to remember. First, accounting for income tax problems typically involve five steps to complete. We've illustrated those five steps throughout this tutorial. The first is to um, begin with the reconciliation from accounting income to taxable income. Then you need to do a calculation of any deferred or future income tax balances and adjustments, and that usually involves a table. It's the most comprehensive uh, approach to use. Third, prepare journal entries to record any current and deferred or future tax expense and recoveries. Fourth, prepare a partial income statement. And fifth, prepare a partial balance sheet.
Next, in the reconciliation from accounting to taxable income, we want to begin with accounting income before taxes, adjust for any permanent differences. Now, some permanent differences may include non-taxable dividends, golf club dues, 50% meals and entertainment, 50% of capital gains, anything like that. Refer to your notes for further examples of permanent differences. Then we adjust for any temporary differences, so things like warranty expense, that's estimated versus actual warranty costs to service, estimated pension expense versus actual contributions, depreciation versus CCA, any deferred revenues, which may be taxable in different periods, deferred expenses, which are deductible in different periods, etc. Then you want to calculate taxable income, and then you calculate the current income tax expense using the current enacted tax rate. When calculating any deferred or future uh, income tax balances adjustments, and we can use uh, DIT for deferred, FIT for future under IFRS and ASPE respectively, consider creating a table. It gets it all in one spot, makes it harder to make some mistakes, and allows you to see the balances and adjustments right in one spot. So we take our tax basis minus the accounting basis times the future tax rate that's enacted. That will give us our ending deferred income tax asset or liability on the balance sheet. If it's a debit balance, it's an asset. And if it's a credit balance, it's a liability. Then we take the ending deferred income tax asset or liability minus the beginning balance, and that will give us a required adjustment. Our journal entries will include a proper debit or credit to current income tax expense or recovery, and then an opposing credit or debit to current income tax payable or receivable. If we have an, a current income tax expense, we'll debit the expense or credit the payable. If we have current income tax recovery, we'll credit the recovery and debit the receivable. We also include deferred income tax expense or benefit and an opposing uh, debit or credit to deferred or future tax liability or asset. So again, if we have an expense, we'll debit the expense, credit the liability. If we have a benefit, then we'll credit the benefit and debit the asset. Our partial income statement should be prepared using intra-period tax allocation format. So it's just a fancy term for saying start with your accounting income before income taxes and then show the provision for current and future or deferred tax expense or recoveries or benefits separately. And then finally, when it comes to our partial balance sheet, we want to make sure that we include the current income tax payable or receivable, make sure we include any long-term deferred asset or long-term deferred liability under IFRS. Under IFRS, all deferred income tax assets and liabilities are classified as long-term. So we cannot net out long-term assets or liabilities against each other. Under ASPE, Current uh, future tax asset or liability, we have to show that. The key is a current future tax asset or liability. Under IFRS, we could show both. If there is only one or the other, we'd show one or the other, but it's possible to see both. Under ASPE, any current future tax assets or liabilities are netted out against each other, and any long-term future tax assets or future tax liabilities are netted up against each other under ASPE. So you'd see on the balance sheet, current future income tax asset or liability and potentially long-term future income tax assets or liabilities, and they can be netted out against each other. So this concludes tutorial 9A. What you might want to do now is review tutorial 9B, which takes the second year of the Prometheus problem, and this time looks at accounting for income taxes, but with an accounting and taxable loss situation.